Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging and expressing my gratitude for the opportunity to meet on the Treaty 13 lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and to reaffirm the Ontario Green Party's commitment to the truth and reconciliation process. I'd also like to offer my sincere condolences to Constables Morgan Russell and Devin Northrup, uh, whose funeral services were held uh, in, in Innisfil yesterday, and just um, express uh, my thoughts and prayers to the family, friends, and colleagues of the fallen officers. Wherever you look in Ontario today, there seems to be a crisis, and the people of Ontario are paying the price for the Ford government's mismanagement of health care, housing, education, energy, social assistance rates, and so much more. I could go on and on. The bottom line is, is that these challenges have real world consequences for the people of this province. Whether they can afford to have a place to call home, whether the next generation can afford to buy a home, whether people can afford to put food on the table, or whether their children will be educated in a stable classroom or thrive in a stable climate, whether people will be able to access the health care when they need it, where they need it. The affordability crisis and the rising cost of living is forcing far too many people to choose between putting food on the table, paying rent, or meeting their mortgage bills. Rents are skyrocketing. Home ownership is out of reach for a whole generation of young people. And while the Ontario Greens put forward solutions to the housing crisis over a year and a half ago, the Ford government has still failed to act, failed to address one of the biggest crises facing people across this province. Over the last 10 years, house prices have increased by 180%, but incomes have only increased by 38%. The wait list for social housing is 185,000 households equaling 481,000 people, or 3.4% of Ontario's population. This is an urgent situation that requires urgent solutions. And so we've heard rumors that the Ford government will be introducing a housing bill next week. And I'm calling on the government in that bill to implement the solutions the Ontario Greens have been calling for for over a year and a half to end exclusionary zoning in this province so we can rapidly ramp up housing supply within our existing built neighborhoods, provide more affordable housing opportunities by expanding inclusionary zoning options and policies, increasing mid-rise development along major roadways and transit lines, and making real substantive investments in uh, social housing, co-op housing, nonprofit housing, and permanent supportive housing. If the government fails to listen to what the experts are saying and what the Ontario Greens have been calling for, I have a whole suite of private members' bills ready to be introduced to address this crisis in the failure of government action. But it's not just housing that people are facing. We're also seeing an unprecedented rise in food prices Food inflation is at a historic 11.4%, the highest in 40 years. One in six households now are facing food insecurity, and food banks are being overwhelmed with the demand of people needing just the basics. And yet grocery store chains are making unprecedented record profits. We've been waiting far too long for the federal government to come forward with a provincial, territorial, and federal grocery code of conduct to help protect suppliers, farmers, and consumers. And so we're calling on the Ontario government to show leadership by insisting on rapid implementation of a grocery code of conduct with real safeguards against predatory pricing, transparent, 
mandatory and enforceable policies. And I believe it is also critical for the provincial government to work with the federal government to bring forward an excess profits tax on grocery chains to prevent them from taking advantage of high inflation rates. The bottom line is, is we don't have a competitive market in our food system when three major chains control over 75% of retail food sales in this country. We need to act now to protect people and to protect local farmers. We also know that the cost of living increase is disproportionately affecting the most vulnerable in our society, especially people living on social assistance rates. I was the first politician in Ontario to call for doubling of social assistance rates in this province. And so once again, I will be renewing my call to the Premier to end legislative poverty in this province by doubling social assistance rates immediately. People with disabilities should not be forced to live in legislative poverty. Poverty costs this province $33 billion a year, and it's time for the government to act, and I will not back down. Ontario Greens will continue to fight to end legislative poverty in this province. Our second set of priorities is that we need to put an end to the chaotic energy policies that this government is putting forward. The bottom line is, is the Premier's chaotic cancellation of renewable energy projects and energy efficiency programs and conservation programs shortly after election in 2018 has led to an energy crunch in the province of Ontario. And now that the government is scrambling to address that, they're doing it in ways that will ramp up gas plants. What does this mean for the people of Ontario? It means higher bills, and more pollution. The Ontario Greens have a better solution. We're calling on the government to rapidly roll out low cost renewable energy projects and to reinstate and move forward with an even more ambitious energy efficiency and conservation program to help people and businesses save money by saving energy, especially as global energy markets continue to see rising prices. And finally, our third priority is that the Greens will continue to push for responsible spending, starting with investing in our crumbling health care system. The Ford government's mismanagement of our health care system in complete disrespect for nurses and other frontline health care workers has brought our health care system to the brink of collapse. People want health care not highways. They want solutions to our health care system. So instead of spending in excess of $10 billion building the Bradford Bypass and Highway 413, Greens are pushing this government in the fall economic statement to redirect those billions of dollars to higher priorities, to ensure stability in our health care and education systems, and to increase social assistance rates to end legislative poverty in this province. So to conclude, the Ontario Greens will continue to fight for solutions to the affordability and cost of living crisis this province is facing. We will continue to push for low-cost clean energy solutions that will help you save money while at the same time addressing the climate crisis. And we will continue to push for responsible investments in the high quality public services, especially health care, education and social services that so many people in this province depend on to maintain their quality of life. I'm happy to answer any questions. What's your response to uh, you mentioned this apparent uh, housing bill and according to the star that it will include um, the changes to conservation authorities and limiting their um, role. Yeah, I'm deeply concerned about media reports about limiting the role of conservation authorities. We absolutely need to increase the supply of housing. But if that supply is going to be put into dangerous locations, especially places that are susceptible to flooding, that puts people's lives and livelihoods at risk. 
You know, in the 1950s when Hurricane Hazel wiped out thousands of homes in this province from flooding and we lost, sadly, hundreds of lives, the province learned from that and brought in additional powers for conservation authorities to ensure that we built housing in places that were safe for people and businesses. To undermine that will not solve the housing crisis. So yes, we need to build more houses in this province. The Ontario Greens have put forward a number of solutions to do that. But we have to make sure that those houses are built in places that are safe for people. What about in the, uh, you know, this coming announcement, you know, according to the Star, to me, sort of the densification of, of urban areas. Mm -hmm. is, that, is, that, is that something you, you like, applaud the government for? Well, we'll have to see what the details of the bill are first before I can do any applauding. So we won't know until Tuesday afternoon. But the Ontario Greens, we're the first party to call for the end of exclusionary zoning in Ontario to ensure that we have as a right zoning to build um, up to fourplexes where we currently have single family homes. We're the first party that said, let's have pre-zoning along major highways and transit lines for mid-rise development. So yes, I've been calling for solutions that lead to more gentle density and missing middle housing in our cities because I think we have to get past the false choice between tall or sprawl. There's a lot of housing solutions in the middle and we can increase housing supply to meet the needs of our population without paving over the farmland that feeds us and the nature that protects us from extreme weather events like flooding. We're seeing, uh, you know, this healthcare crisis kind of you know, take on a sort of another chapter right now. Mm -hmm. where children's hospitals are being hit hard. ERs are still closing, even though it's not supposedly vacation time. And uh, ambulances are lined up. It's major offload delays. We're seeing code reds, code blacks among paramedics. What uh, what would you like to see done that can address those issues? And we haven't even hit. Flu yeah, we're well, absolutely right. I'm deeply concerned about the effect cold and flu season and what appears to be rising rising COVID COVID infections as well on our healthcare system. The bottom line is is you know the Ford government is bragging about a budget surplus at a time when our healthcare system is literally crumbling before our eyes. It doesn't take a healthcare policy expert to see that emergency rooms are closing. That um, Ambulances are having challenges in terms of offloading patients. And the government's response has been to deny that there's a crisis and to fail to provide the investments we need in publicly funded, publicly delivered health care. So what's it going to take? First step, repeal Bill 124 and provide nurses and other frontline health care workers with the wages and benefits they deserve with better working conditions. Second, we could be fast-tracking uh, the accreditation of foreign-trained and internationally trained doctors and nurses. The government has made some small steps in that direction, but the bottom line is, according to the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario, we have 15 to 20,000 internationally trained healthcare professionals in this province that could help alleviate the staffing shortages we're seeing in our healthcare system. But the government has failed to fast track the accreditation of those health care providers over the last few years. And then finally, we need to make the budgetary investments in health care to shore up our health care system. You know, the government said Bill 7, which essentially was to force seniors without their consent into long term care homes that either they are too far from family or they don't feel is safe or appropriate for them would alleviate the health care crisis. Well, the bottom line is, as you mentioned in the question, many of the challenges are actually in pediatric and children's hospitals, where the last time I checked, there aren't a number of elderly folks. So the government's response, that's just one example of how the government's response hasn't met the moment or the issues that we're confronting in our health care system. Uh, and so instead of bragging about surpluses, I say they need to deliver solutions that benefit the people of Ontario. In terms of rising, you know, costs for, for people, sort of out of control inflation, you're, you're talking a little bit about this um, is it code of conduct. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more about uh, to sort of guard against this kind of predatory pricing that we're 
We're seeing what, how does that, how would that work? Yeah, so we've seen other jurisdictions, the UK in particular, but also looking at Australia and New Zealand. Um, and there are conversations happening in Canada right now at the federal level to bring in a grocery code of conduct that would help protect local farmers and suppliers from predatory practices. So we're saying let's move forward with those practices, but let's also include protections for consumers. Um, you know, we're all well aware of the price, uh, the bread price fixing scandal that took place among the three major grocers. Um, that's just one of uh, a number of examples of where retail concentration in the grocery sector is damaging both consumers and local farmers and suppliers because we simply don't have a competitive market in, in food retail when you have the three top uh, retail food chain controlling over 75% of the marketplace. So let's look at other jurisdictions that have brought forward solutions and bring them forward here in Ontario. You know, the bottom line is, is that, um, you know, net, uh, net margin earnings for the three major grocers, for one, it's up 16%, for another, it's up 41%, and for a third, it's doubled. Can you imagine that doubled? So we've seen... Um, excess profits uh, from the grocery chains uh, during the pandemic uh, and, and you know, as compared to between the years between 2014 and 2019, for example. And a lot of that's being driven by the fact that they have concentrated power in the marketplace. And we believe there needs to be solutions put forward that protect local farmers and suppliers and consumers uh, so these large grocery chains don't profit uh, from inflation. Would you want to see some type of investigation into price gouging? Absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, we believe, we believe that most of this should happen at the federal level um, because it should be something happening across the country. Uh, as the largest pro province in, in, in the federation, we believe Ontario should lead pushing the federal government to act on these issues. And if the federal, federal government fails to act, then at the very least, Ontario needs to take action within this province to protect Ontarians. And I'm good. If you I gotta, keep going. Sorry, <laughs> uh, on the education front, where it seems like we're uh, heading, potentially heading towards some uh, disruption, mm -hmm. what do you want to see there? Yeah, I mean, I think the instead of uh, one denigrating teachers and the unions that represent teachers and education workers, uh, we need the minister and the premier to be at the bargaining table, bargaining in good faith, recognizing that education workers in particular um, are some of the lowest paid uh, public sector workers we have in the province. They deserve fair wages, especially during inflationary times. And we also need to make sure that the investments are in place, that we have uh, lower class sizes, that we address the shortage of educational assistance and other education workers that provide supports for students, especially students with special needs, and that also address some of the workplace challenges that teachers and other education workers face. Uh, you know, so instead of spending hundreds of millions of dollars uh, directing payments to parents and pitting parents against teachers and education workers, that money should be invested in our schools. We know that that is the most cost efficient and effective way of addressing the learning gaps that our students are facing. Uh, and ensuring high quality education and ensuring stability in our classrooms. And I just want to close by reminding folks that in 2019, we had disruption in our school systems due to the negotiation approach uh, of the Ford government, where they were trying to increase class sizes and bring in mandatory online learning. And teachers and education workers held the line and stood up for students. And can you imagine what it would have been like in our classrooms during the pandemic if the Ford government had gotten their way and had higher class sizes. And clearly the pandemic has shown that mandatory online learning isn't what our students need. So maybe this government actually needs to listen to the experts, the frontline workers in our schools on what our students need because thankfully they stood up for our students prior to the pandemic 
and I know they'll continue to stand up for students post-pandemic. Probably my last question. The, um, since 2017, I think we've seen uh, more than 100% increase in opioid deaths yeah. in the province. Um, I know you've spoken about this yeah. a lot. It's gotten worse every single year. Market jump yeah. during the pandemic. You've spoken about it a lot. We haven't heard much from the government, though, on this on this particular health crisis. What uh, what would you like them to do? Yeah, I, I'm just deeply disappointed that the premier has failed to really even talk about solutions to the opioid crisis and the substance, the poison substance supply crisis we're facing. And we've lost far too many Ontarians, and those deaths could have been prevented. So the first step is we need to stop approaching this as a criminal justice issue and approach it as a health care issue and a public health emergency. Second, we need, as part of that, we need to ensure that we have safe supply and we implement harm reduction policies. One example of that would be to expand the number of consumption treatment sites uh, available in the province of Ontario, which the Ford government has capped. In conjunction with that, we need to expand the number of treatment uh, spaces that are available for people with substance use challenges. We need to start directing more resources into mental health and addiction supports so people can access the care and services they need when they need it and in a way that's affordable for people, which is why we've been proposing that mental health and addiction services should be provided through OHIP. If we truly believe that mental health is health, then it should be funded and accessible in the same way that physical health is. And then finally, we know that one of the biggest challenges people are facing uh, that can, not always, but can lead to substance use is poverty and lack of housing. And it's one of the reasons we've been so aggressively promoting permanent supportive housing solutions with wraparound mental health, addictions, and other supports for people. We know that every $10 invested in permanent supportive housing saves the government $21.72 in other costs, health care costs, criminal justice costs, uh, social service costs, and it improves the quality of life for the people who are currently unhoused. Um, so we know there are solutions, and we know there are solutions that will actually take pressure off of our health care system, our police services, our criminal justice system, our social service uh, systems that, that can be implemented. But unfortunately, the Ford government has just simply failed to act and in most cases completely ignored the crisis that so many people in our communities are facing. Great. Okay, thanks everyone. See you all next week.